Good morning. I'll tell you what, uh, it feels a lot better being Atlanta, in Atlanta for a morning speech than it did recently being in Dallas for an evening speech with lots of liquor. Uh, let, me, let me tell you the story. And by the way, I don't do jokes. I just kind of look at the world as I go through it, and there's always a story to tell. There was a convention of 1,000 people in the jewelry business. Uh, they were all CEOs, retailers, manufacturers, and distributors. And they'd had a three-day conference, and the way it was going to wrap up is they were going to have a cocktail hour from 6 until 7, my closing keynote speech from 7 until 8, and a big gala awards dinner. Well, the bars opened promptly at 6, and I could tell immediately these folks were uh, two-fisted drinkers. Uh, I saw one guy go up, and he ordered two more doubles, and I said, you're not going to have more to drink before I talk, are you? And he said, the more I drink, the better you're going to sound. <laughs> So at 7 o'clock, I'm set to get on, and I said, you better get the show on the road. No, 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 they've had a few hard days. Let them have another couple soda pops. We'll get going here in about a half hour. So at 7.30, I'm tugging on the arm of the guy who's supposed to introduce me. Please, let's get going. We're going to have last call right now. We're well, going a half hour. So after a two-hour cocktail party, I mean, everybody is smashed. The guy gets up to introduce me with God as my witness. He's got an introduction in front of him. He's so drunk, he can't make out any of the words. So the total introduction consisted of, here's Jason. <laughs> I walk up on stage, I look out at the audience, and I say, good evening. And some guy in the back of the room shouts out, shut up. <laughs> now, you know this is going to happen at some point in your life, but you are not ready for it. And so I pretended I didn't hear him, and I said, let's try that one more time. Good evening. And the same guy shouted out, I said shut up. We don't need no stupid speakers. We need strippers like we used to have. <laughs> and the whole room starts going, stripper, stripper, stripper. So I start taking my clothes off, you know, but how far is that action going to go? The very next day, I had to get from Dallas to Palm Beach, Florida for a speech at the Breakers Hotel. And uh, you only do that through Atlanta. So uh, I'm on the early... Oh, by the way, this story doesn't go where you think it's going to go. The exact same thing that happened to me that morning could happen to you if you start to take yourself too seriously. So I'm sitting on the Delta flight in Dallas, and we're a half hour late, we're an hour late, we're an hour and a half late. And finally the captain comes on and he says, well, boys and girls, you can tell, uh, we've had a little mechanical problem, but we'll be leaving shortly. He said, the problem is uh, the bathroom, the toilets don't flush, so I've directed the flight attendants to lock the bathrooms, and you'll just have to hold it until you get to Atlanta. <laughs> now, I drink a lot of water, so this is going to be a little bit of a problem, and by the time we finally landed Atlanta, I got to go to the bathroom more than I've ever had to go. So I'm running down the T concourse, I finally see a men's room, I go running in, and they've got yellow caution tape across all the urinals because <laughs> they're repairing the white tile walls, and I thought, that's okay, I'll use a stall. So I back into a stall, hang my backpack up, I turn around, and a voice comes from the next stall, and the voice says, Hi, how are you? <laughs> and I'm going, Senator, I thought they shut you down years ago, dude. <laughs> and I said, I'm fine. And the voice from the next stall says, What are you up to? <laughs> and I said, Well, I'm traveling, just like you. And the voice from the next stall says, Can I come over and hang out for a while? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm kind of tied up right now. And the voice in the next stall says, honey, I got to get off the phone. There's some pervert in the next stall. <laughs> Honest to God. And every time I ask you a question, he answers me. You have never seen anybody escape from a bathroom so quickly in your life. I was told earlier this morning that I had a seat waiting for me up here at, at the executive table, the reserve table. And I said, there's no way. I said, I am so nervous before a speech, I will be in the back of the room probably doing jumping jacks or something. And I'm always curious. Let me ask you a question. If you had to get up here for an hour and give a speech, how many of you would admit to being nervous? Raise your hand. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it. You know, a lot of studies show that people say that they're actually more frightened of public speaking than they are of dying, and I'm not going to go quite that far. But people always ask me, what do you get nervous about? And so I thought I would tell that story before we jump into it. I have never missed a speech in my life. If I'm hired to do a speech, I am going to be there. I will show up. I've driven through snowstorms all night long. I've spoken with a broken leg at this hotel that nobody knew was broken until after the speech. So, so if I'm hired, I, 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 I'm not worried about me. I will be there. I'm always worried that nobody will show up to listen to the speech. And you may say, well, what a stupid, unfounded fear, uh, unless it's happened to you once. And here's the story. I was invited to go to India, 
and give the opening keynote speech at a conference entitled Advertising and Developing Third World Nations being put on by this American promoter. At that point, I'd never been in New Delhi before, so I had a couple of great days in New Delhi, at Old Delhi. Conference is supposed to start at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, so by 7 o'clock, I'm dressed. I'm down there. I want to shake hands with folks. There are beautiful ladies and saris at long tables, 400 name badges. Not one person showed up for the event. Nobody. It turns out it was the final day of the cricket test between India and Pakistan. Now, to put that in perspective, that is so big, it's like the Super Bowl times 100. The two governments had actually declared a truce in their war over Kashmir to finish this damn cricket test. So I'm thinking, well, there's no speech today. Well, at about two minutes before nine, this big American promoter bellies up to me. And he says, are you all set for your speech? And I said, no, there's nobody here. And he looked at me and he said, have you been paid? And I said, yes. He said, well, dance for daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you did not expect me to get up and give a speech to an empty room. He said, I certainly would. He said, except one person showed up and the show must go on. So with 399 empty seats and one guy in the back of the room, he does this introduction that is just beautiful. And I'm thinking, well, if this Jennings is so good, why in the hell did nobody show up? And I, it was going to be a 90-minute speech. I'm going, dear God, please let some more people show up. But nobody else showed up. So it was me and one guy in the back of the room. At the end of the longest 90 minutes of my life, I looked around the room, I said, I want to thank uh, you, I mean, for having been here. The guy starts to clap. I start walking out. The guy walks up to me and he says, would you stick around for a while? I'm the next speaker. <laughs> Keep your eyes open as you go through life and you will always have a story to tell. I am so honored to be here today. And any time I hear a speaker begin saying how honored they are to be someplace, the words always sound so disingenuous to me because um, I figure they begin every speech the exact same way. So let me put it into perspective. Um, I, I, don't, I don't speak. That would make me nervous. I, I see myself as a teacher. I love to teach businesses how to grow. And I get to do that 80 times a year. So anytime anybody thinks enough of me and my body of work to put me in front of their most precious asset, their members or their customers or their employees, uh, it, it is, it's humbling and, and it is an honor. That's the good news. The bad news is we get about 30 to 40 calls a week for speeches. That's a couple of thousand a year. I can say yes 80 times. So we have to say no about 1,900 times a year. Your industry has just always absolutely, I've been a customer of yours a number of times over the years. I just, I find it to be a fascinating industry. And when the request came through, I said, you've got to get this one for me because I really want to be in front of these people. So um, I'm glad that you picked me, but I want you to understand I picked you too. And, and there is no place that I would rather be for our time together uh, than this morning. Uh, by the way, Linda, I, I have to tell you, I was standing in the back of the room. I think that was probably one of the very best speeches I've ever heard given by a CEO. It was thoughtful, it was authentic, it was challenging, uh, thought-provoking. Let's give her one more round of applause. And, um, uh, and, and as you will see, it is going to so perfectly dovetail with everything I'm going to talk about today. I have a problem with some other authors uh, who I've seen speak. I, I make it a point not to study my competition, uh, but on occasion I've been stuck in the room and it would have been seen as impolite to leave. And almost invariably I've thought to myself, you know, if they had just talked to some of the people in the audience, if they knew what they did, what they were responsible for, the challenges they faced, they would have been a lot more relevant. So not only did Linda and I have an opportunity to spend an hour together, uh, but I also had an opportunity to reach out and have discussions with about 10 of you. And for those of you I've spoken with over the past couple of weeks, you'll recall the questions I asked you. Uh, the first question is, tell me about your company. I, I mean, I want to hear all about it, Maureen. Tell me all about what's your, your company in Chicago. Uh, the second question is, tell me your story. I mean, where are you from? How'd you get into the industry? How'd you get to where you are? And the third question I ask everybody I talk to is, what keeps you awake at night about business? What are the challenges? What are the stumbling blocks that could prevent your business from achieving its full economic potential? Let's go to the screen, because I want to show you what you told me during our discussions. Let's take a look. Number one, finding, keeping, and growing the right people. I think that came up in every single conversation that I had. Rogue competition. Uh, the barriers are low, and, I, and, and the word rogue came up in 
many of my conversations. However, then in a couple of com uh, conversations, uh, the people I spoke with had a different take on it. They said, uh, look, do we call everybody who doesn't have a padded van a rogue? Um, are, are we going to call all of our competitors rogues? B b because that's going to get in the way of our growing. You said, you told me, we must stop playing the game not to lose and start playing the game to win, big time. We must embrace new opportunities, and we must never become protection-oriented. We should sell what customers want to buy, not what we necessarily want to sell. You also told me, look, we have an absolute need to remain relevant. We must be willing to move faster. We must be willing to be more innovative. We must always be looking to grow. Well, those are the things that you told me. Those were my takeaways. So today, here's what we're going to talk about. The six leadership secrets for embracing constant change and growth. Now, I'm not a cynic, but if I were sitting in the audience and some guy was up on stage and said, I'm going to share these six big secrets, I mean, for embracing constant change and growth, uh, I'd be sitting in the audience probably saying to myself, yeah, where did you get these secrets? Went to the bottom of a mountain and somebody came down with stone tablets. So let me explain where these six secrets that I'm going to share with you came from. Um, over the past 12 years, my research teams and I have screened more than 220,000 companies. That is the number. During the process, we've built big, thick dossiers on more than 45,000 businesses. In the process, we have interviewed more than 11,000 CEOs and business owners. We have generated more than 500,000 pages of interview transcripts. And we wrote the books on speed, productivity, growth, leadership, and reinvention. 